South Sudan, the world's youngest country, has been plunged into a conflict being fought along political and ethnic lines. World Vision CEO Dave Toyson is recently back from the troubled nation, and he joins us now from the nation's capital with more. Dave, it's always good to have you on the program. How are you? Oh, just fine. Thank you, Steve. Not at all. We want to take a look at what we called, uh, I guess it is, the uh, youngest country in the world, having just been voted in by the United Nations not too long ago. Uh, how long were you there for, Dave? I was just there for about three days. And what was the purpose of the trip? Basically, I was there to see the work that we're doing uh, with the displaced, as well as to get a, a closer sense of the uh, situation there. I've been to Sudan, South Sudan, uh, many, many numbers of times. And you've got how many people there now doing work on the ground for you? Well, we've got close to 100 people, if you include all the work that we're doing in different parts of the country, not even just the parts of the country where there's conflict. And what are they trying to do? Well, basically, we've been focused on uh, humanitarian work because of the recent violence uh, in Upper Nile, particularly that state. Uh, and we have basically are doing food distribution, providing plastic sheeting, some tents, uh, hygiene products, soap, uh, and frankly, just being there to be in solidarity with the people that are going through very difficult times. Mm -hmm. You did take some video while you were there, and we want to show a snippet of that video, and then we'll come back and chat, okay? Now, this is in, I guess this is right close to the border, right? In, um, of the border of Sudan and South Sudan. And Dave, yeah, it looks uh, like a well, bomb hit the place. Can you talk us through this video? Well, th this is the city of Malakal, mm -hmm. and it's a city of about 100,000 people, town, and it's just empty. Uh, the, the last uh, incursion, it's gone back and forth between the government forces and the opposition. And the last, uh, the last attack against it, they, they literally burned and looted everything. The hospitals, schools, churches. Uh, it was, it, it, frankly, it was a, just an overwhelming experience to see so much destruction. And just imagining uh, what's happened to the people. There's nobody left in the town. They've all fled, and then there's a, there's a camp for the internally displaced. Basically, they, the UN mission gave up some of their space, and they've now got 16,000 people is the estimate in a space of about, that uh, I think might comfortably hold 800 or 1,000 people at the most. Okay, but uh, I think the most reliable estimates I've seen are that 860,000 people have been displaced by the violence just to, over the last few months. So if, if 1,600 are there, where's everybody else? Well, this is 16,000. Uh, 16,000, excuse me. And this is just one location. This is the town of Malakal, and there's, there's been uh, conflict in a number of other cities as well. So you're absolutely right. It's uh, 800,000 people that have been internally displaced. And then if you add the people who've actually fled to neighboring countries, it's over a million people have been displaced. And then finally, maybe enough of the numbers, but it's almost 5 million people that are considered in need of help of uh, some kind of humanitarian help in the whole country. That's, that's uh, almost 5 million out of a population of 11 million. Hmm. Knowing you as I do from your many visits to this program, I know you would love to help them all. But given what you are actually able to do, how many can you help? Well, we, we, we try to set targets in these situations as we're doing our assessments. So we, we've helped at this point a little over 15,000 people and obviously, we'd like to double or even triple that if we can. And we've focused uh, particularly on children as well. I think one of the most moving things was to go into this uh, displaced camp and to see whole tents uh, with primarily children. And then in the opposite of that, see whole tents, and I'm talking about here large tents, 30, 40, uh, elderly people who've just had no uh, family members that have stayed behind to look after them. Their family members may have been chased away, and they, they simply couldn't keep up. And so it's that kind of environment that just, just tears your heart apart. Dave, I know you are a humanitarian. You're a guy who's, you know, who sees it as his role in the world to uh, try to repair the world, uh, to, bring, to bring help to people who really need it. And uh, I only set that up because I know you're not into the politics, and you're not necessarily into the geostrategic uh, insights around it all, but perhaps you could help us understand why this small country, South Sudan, uh, which seemed to start with a good deal of optimism once it broke away from Sudan and had the world recognize it as an official country, 
why this thing has gone so badly so quickly? Well, of course, that's always the, the big question. Uh, I, I, was, I was in South Sudan just two months before the election. This was back in 2010. And I remember so well, uh, particularly older people, elderly people, were talking about the first time they've ever been able to vote. And they talked about freedom and they talked about the new opportunities for their country. So it's, it's really sad to see this kind of conflict happen. Uh, at the one level, uh, people might say that it, it's not too surprising because there's been so much conflict in this country, uh, 17 years of civil war before. So there's, there's a, a, a lot of guns in the country uh, and they've hit bumps in terms of disagreements amongst the leadership from various sides. And so this thing, I think it, it became conflicted faster than most people expected. It certainly caught, I, I think it caught many people by surprise. Uh, but, but basically there was a falling out uh, in, and, there was, and there was conflict uh, within the government itself. And all of this just very, quite quickly actually descended into conflict between various sides. Uh, some of it political, some of it uh, ethnic related, some of, some of it, a lot of it, a combination of both. Well, that's what I wanted to follow up on because certainly when, when, a, when a president fears his vice president is going to launch a coup against him, that is a political problem. But everything I've been reading lately suggests this has morphed into another tribal slash ethnic problem, uh, the likes of which we have seen far too often, uh, particularly in Africa, particularly 20 years ago right now, Rwanda. So does it feel that way to you? It, it certainly it has the potential. I mean, I think it's important to remember it's about three or four states out of 11 states in the country that are affected by this, this uh, conflict. So fortunately, it's not the whole country yet. I don't think it's, you know, we wouldn't want to compare it to Rwanda, certainly. But if, if there isn't uh, pressure and the peace uh, talks that are going on in Addis Ababa, they've been, they've been very troubled and, and there's lots of difficulties around them. But that's really, I think, where the hope is for the future. Uh, we, we feel strongly at World Vision that uh, it, it would be really helpful if the people at the peace table in Addis could also be people from the faith community, from uh, particularly Christian, because it's predominantly Christian in the South, but also uh, civil society being represented as well. Neither of those voices have been at the peace talks. And I, I think that could be very helpful in finding a way forward. Are there troops from other countries that have come into this as well? Well, there's, there's, there's UN mission troops from different countries uh, around the world. They're present, for example, in wherever there's a, a, a UN uh, mission presence. So they're certainly providing uh, some protection, uh, but there's, at this point, it's, there, there certainly aren't enough troops there now to uh, you know, handle the, the conflict that's been going. At least that's been the experience so far. I have heard, though, that some troops from Uganda have joined on the government side of things and are trying to play a role in this. Have you heard that? Yeah, yes, I've heard that. I, I'm not an authority on that, but I've heard that they, that they have been present. Uh, Dave, I know, again, because you're not a geostrategic thinker on this stuff, you don't tend to like to look at these things in terms of who's winning and who's losing. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality is, at the end of the day, someone is going to win, someone's going to lose, or potentially there'll be a nice compromise that comes out of it, although it seems pretty impossible at the moment. But as you look at it, can you tell if one side is dominating the other? No, I, I, I couldn't say that at this point. I mean, I think, I mean, you've touched on it already. I think what's so important is to create an environment where all the various parties involved can see an advantage to reconcile and make peace. That, that's what we're certainly calling for. That's what needs to happen. And of course, it's, it's almost in every situation, it's bumpy, but that's what we have to keep working at so that, that both the, the parties that are in conflict with each other can actually see advantage in putting their guns down and working out a compromise. That's certainly our hope and prayer. In Darfur, in Sudan, much of the world, including Colin Powell when he was Secretary of State, had no hesitation in calling what they saw there genocide. Are you prepared to call what you're seeing in South Sudan genocide? Well, I confess... <laughs> I, I'm not a specialist in the technical definition of a genocide. Uh, obviously, it's, it's apparent that people from one ethnic group have killed another. That's, that's certainly true. Uh, but I, I guess I'd be reluctant at this point to say 
that, that that is so vast that it has to be seen as a genocide. I hope we don't get there, actually. But we will, I think, unless we're prepared as in Canada, as well as many other countries, are willing to really invest in a process that's going to bring this thing to a peace. Okay, let me read you an excerpt from the Christian Science Monitor that they published not that long ago, and then I'll get you to react to it. Uh, the Monitor writes, It is also clear that one reason hostilities flamed so brightly in December and spread so quickly owes to a powerfully reinforced culture of young men and guns in this part of East Africa. Boys like Mabior, particularly in rural areas, grow up with few options besides joining armed groups and taking possession of a gun, both symbols of power that bring a sense of identity, masculinity, worth, and place. Yes, youth see each other die on the front lines, but in this hard scrabble part of Africa, a mix of local economies, peer pressure, and the need to simply defend one's village and family draw in young men to a culture in which violence and conflict seem normal. But it isn't just pay. Being masculine and being in the military has a strong allure, and young men will remain soldiers for months without receiving salaries, living with their families in village-like barracks. Dave, have you seen this? Well, I haven't seen it directly because we were in, we were in areas where it was internally displaced people. But I've certainly heard reports of that. And I, I think it's in some ways not a surprising statement when you've had guns being distributed from all different parties for, for the last, what, 25, 30 years in Sudan. And so it's, it's not surprising. And especially when people, uh, they, they feel as if they have almost no option or they're, they're not getting enough of the basic benefits of life. And we know there's been statistical studies that young men, particularly the ages, I think, 16 to like 29, if they're unemployed, if, they're, if, if in any way they're marginalized, their likelihood to resort to violence is very high. But if that need for the gun and the status that a gun represents is so entrenched in everything there, how do you demilitarize a place like that? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a very long and painful process. The most important thing is you have to have some kind of agreement that, that sets some sort of equal footing so that people are willing to uh, give up their arms and uh, be involved in a, you know, a, a, a weapons-free uh, kind of process. Uh, but, I, but once again, it's extremely difficult to do that. But I think that's what has to happen uh, in South Sudan, or this, this uh, killing will just continue to go on. You, and, and of course, these weapons come from Western countries, and this has been going on for a long time. And so uh, I'm not trying to make any excuses for it because it's a terrible thing. But I think you have to look at it as rationally as you can and try to sort out where, where are the pressure points, where are the guns coming from, how are they being distributed, what kind of accountability is there amongst the, the various groups that are, that are part of the conflict. Seems pretty clear that Western countries are not going to put boots on the ground to try to pull these two sides apart. Can you imagine, though, other African countries bringing troops to the fore and interceding somehow, either for good or for ill? Well, there, there is certainly uh, the Africa Union is, is certainly engaged in, in the peace talks. And certainly uh, there's the potential that they certainly will provide some leadership in this situation. Uh, whether or not there, there will be enough simply with the Africa Union. Obviously, the UN is already there, but I still think there's, there's a place for, for Western countries uh, like Canada to, to be involved both behind the scenes, encouraging, providing support wherever they can, and then, of course, dealing with just, I mean, the humanitarian crisis is, is really troubling because we've got two things coming up now. Uh, we're going to start the rainy season, it started in a few places, and that means in many parts of Sudan, it's very difficult to move things around because the, the roads are just, just about impassable. And then combined with the conflict, where it's not safe in many places to be able to be on the road. And then the second part of this is the farmers, many of the people that are in these centers, they're rural farmers. And if they don't get out to plant in the planting season over the next couple of months, we're going to have more food shortage and who knows what, what that could turn into. And that, of course, will also could in some ways make the, uh, the violence and the fighting even worse. Hmm. How long has World Vision been in Sudan? Oh, I think we've been in there uh, close to 40 years. 40 years. Is the, work that you have been in, is the work that you have been doing there for 40 years now undermined by virtue of the violence you're seeing in South Sudan? 
Oh, yes. I, I, I think the, it definitely sets the country back. Whether you're talking about things being destroyed, in some places, wells, for example, have been destroyed. Obviously, housing, so all of that can, you know, ob obviously is negative. On the other hand, I have to say, in other parts of the country, uh, we've had reasonable success with development work over the last number of years in terms of education, health care, uh, water wells. So it, it isn't a zero game here. There, there's gains that have been made, and not all of that's been lost. But certainly in, certainly in Malakal, where, where I was, in that area, they, they, it really is. They, I mean, everything's been destroyed. It's terrible. There's a kind of... Uh, it's a it feels just so cruel and violent to, to, to destroy things that are critical to saving people's lives, especially when you see hospitals just torn apart. Hmm. And just finally, Dave, we, we did refer earlier in our conversation to the 2011 referendum, which created South Sudan. There was an overwhelming support for that referendum. This new country was created. It got off to what seemed like a very hopeful and optimistic start. They are now where they are. Do you see a role for the West in any of this? And if so, what? Well, I, I think it's important for, for the West to continue to be engaged, particularly when it comes to the humanitarian assistance and support for, for the peacemaking that's, that's the most critical of all in the country, to simply get this people to stop fighting and to find some common ground so that they can come together. I mean, that's our hope. And uh, I, we're not going to give up on that. But is it going to be difficult? Yes. Is it complicated? Yes. But will it change if everybody just stands by and watches? I don't think so. Dave, we always appreciate your visits to TVO and sharing your insights on some f fairly far-flung places in our world. As always, uh, be safe out there, and thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. Dave Toyson, President, CEO, World Vision Canada. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.